shit, this don't look like the Lincoln Tunnel, Sam. Looks to me like another marginally volatile episode of the Help Me, I Am In Hell show, starring the long-suffering Shanghai Pete, the people's champion, 21st century digital boy, and high-tech lowlife. First of all, um, let me congratulate all of you for making it to the year 2021, where the uh, universe is a haunted house and everything you may have once loved is a cathedral in flames. And it just gets worse from here. So friends, let us once again take shelter by the flickering firelight of another episode of Degreelessness and try to wait out the night. So today, instead of getting deep inside a complex issue that, despite impacting nearly every aspect of gaming no one is talking about for some utterly inexplicable reason, we're going to do a review of the year 2020 itself. So how was it? Well, it was shit, it was piss. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. Well, I mean, not about the fact that it was shit and piss, it was totally shit and piss, but no, that's not the end of the episode. So first up tonight, we've got some just absolutely incredible breaking news. So unprecedented and stunning. Just many channels have actually seen fit to devote over half their videos from the past month to it. <laughs> Holy shit, sounds like a big deal, right? What is it? Well, brace yourselves, but apparently Cyberpunk 2077 is still not yet a perfect game. And, and get this, CDPR? Still doing damage control. Oh my fucking God. I, they just put another video out the other day where they continue to prostrate themselves at the feet of an angry internet mob, which are probably the only people who still even care. Uh, that is, if only mentioning something when it's part of a social media performance you're putting on solely for the benefit of an audience is the same thing as caring. Uh, I don't even, I don't even know anymore. I've lost the capacity to tell the difference. <laughs> if there even still is one. Which is not to say, of course, that CDPR shouldn't be contrite in doing everything they possibly can to fix the game. Obviously they should. And as far as I can tell, they are. Uh, great, you fucked up now since you're not EA. Fix your shit. Oh, you are, good, okay. Is there any other reason anyone should be continuing to talk about this? I mean, aside from grifting clicks and engagement farming, I mean. Oh, oh, there's not? Okay, right. Uh, rest assured, when there is something to actually discuss, like any real major fixes, content additions, or any info at all that's more than just ARG CDPR rage bait still gets clicks, right? Uh, we will absolutely be getting deep inside it. But until then, I don't think there's anything to be gained by continuing to uncritically parrot the current industry dogma about this game. I stand by my review. So exactly how far am I in it, you may be wondering, or how much have I played? Uh, at this point, maybe you're not wondering that, I don't know. I'm gonna tell you anyway. At this point, I've cleared the game on my first character. I put in like just about 100 hours and I just started my second playthrough. I'm enjoying this game. Does that mean that you will or that it's inarguably awesome? It just means what I said, I'm enjoying it. Does that simple fact override or invalidate any of the well-deserved criticisms leveled at it or CDPR themselves? Obviously not, of course not. A game can be full of bugs and yet still be fun. Those two things aren't mutually exclusive. <laughs> it's crazy, right? Believe it or not, stuff like that used to be fairly widely understood by most people. Uh, I mean, that is until our society decided to replace the concept of sincerity with social media performance. Fortunately, uh, I'm too old to give a fuck about social media, so I have no problem saying shit like that. Uh, so yeah, I'm having a blast with it, and I'm also stunning and brave. Uh, sure, it's a b buggy, unfinished mess that no AAA publisher should ever get away with putting out, but hasn't stopped me from enjoying it, and I'm gonna tell you that. And, and why should it? It certainly never stopped industry apologists from shamelessly filleting other broken, unfinished, buggy games that fall short of expectations whenever doing so lines with their corporate approved narrative, so, hey, let me do that shit too, yo. Uh, at, least, at least when I say I'm having fun with it, you know it's because that's the truth and not because my career relies on staying within the good graces of AAA publishers. Uh, so for what I'm sure won't be the last time, just because I think there's a great game buried beneath this disaster, this is never an excuse for CDPR or any developer to release a game in this state, and they deserve just about all the shit that they're getting for it. Regardless of whatever the eventual consensus about Cyberpunk 2077 ends up being, I. I think that it's, it's a legacy is already pretty clear. So congrats CDPR, you finally escaped the shadow and the legacy of The Witcher 3. Unfortunately, you did it by creating a whole new one as the publisher that helped prove that no company deserves your loyalty. And when it comes to gaming or any capitalist industry, there's no such thing as good guys. See, that wasn't so hard, right? And I didn't even need 20 videos to do it. Okay, and uh, now we're gonna talk about the games from 2020 that we've been playing and the ones we recommend. 
Uh, obviously, first up, you know that I think Doom Eternal is insanely great. Nothing comes close to the twitchy, like, amphetamine-fueled FPS nonsense that is Doom like this game. And if there's any part of you that likes that stuff, you owe it to yourself to check this one out if you have not already. Next up, Baldur's Gate 3. I'm not really a long-term fan of this series or even this type of RPG, so <laughs> take my opinion with the proverbial grain of salt and all that, but... I've been really impressed by this one. The art is gorgeous, storytelling is super immersive, environment design is fantastic. Great for any RPG fan, especially if you love the previous Baldur's Gate games. Moving on, this may surprise some of you, but... <laughs> uh, dude, I love it. Genshin Impact. Genshin Impact is fucking great. Seriously, uh, a fantastic Breath of the Wild-like RPG. Breath of the Wild-like? Is that a thing now? Maybe. Um, but either way, considering it's free, I definitely recommend this one too. Just stay away from all the gotcha stuff, obviously. Fortunately, it's super easy to do that. Next, I do want to mention Trials of Mana again. I talked about this earlier in the year when it first came out, but like, it's really fucking phenomenal. Super rare that a SNES classic like this gets a remake that is actually good. Do not play the Secret of Mana remake. It's straight Garbo. Um, but they actually really pull it off here. Secret of Mana and its sequel, the game Trials is based on Second Densetsu 3. Some of my favorite games of all time. And trust when I say that Surprisingly, shockingly, Trials actually does it justice. Uh, we also played a lot of Ghost Runner, which if you haven't heard of it, it's a cyberpunk sort of first person like ninja simulator. I don't know. It's not really an FPS. It's more of a puzzle game in first person perspective where you move from room to room and sort of need to figure out the best way to defeat the enemies in advance. You die in one hit, so it's very much more focused on finding optimal padding and puzzle solving. As an example, like I died 300 times in one room just trying to figure out one certain route. So definitely not for everybody, but it's a super interesting concept that I suggest you check out if you like cyberpunk stuff and, you know, swords and ninjas, which I mean, fuck, who doesn't, right? Another one is Hades, of course. You don't need me to tell you about that. Probably also don't need me to advise you to play Black Mesa, the Half-Life 1 remake, but in case you do, definitely play that motherfucker. It's awesome. Uh, I actually paid for it. <laughs> Other honorable mentions are uh, some FPS's Proteus, which is still in early access, I think. Serious Sam 4, which if you love Serious Sam, you will love this. If you do not like Serious Sam, this will not change your mind. Streets of Rage 4, surprisingly, it was actually fucking dope. And the PC version of Halo 3, all fantastic. Lastly, if you'll <laughs> indulge me for just a moment, I do want to briefly mention Dragon Quest XI. Uh, I say briefly because um, it is number 11, and if you're a Dragon Quest fan, well, you likely already know far more about this game than I even do. Uh, the first Dragon Quest game that I played, though, was Dragon Warrior on NES, also Dragon Quest I. Um, now, because I was a normal middle-class kid with parents that didn't spoil me, I only got about two video games a year, one for my birthday, one for Christmas. and. You know, since I was like four, like most kids in the U.S. around that time, I wasn't going to waste one of my two games per year on an RPG. I mean, fuck, most of us didn't even know what an RPG was back then. So how or why did I end up playing Dragon Warrior on NES in 1990 then? Well, because I was allowed one magazine subscription back then, and the one that I had was for Nintendo Power. Some of you may not know this, but a magazine was like, uh, it's hard to describe, but it was this thing we had back in the day, sort of like a blog, like Polygon, except it was printed on paper and mailed to your house. Oh, and it didn't suck, also, it was cool. Uh, yes, before the internet, they, they just mailed articles to your house, super weird. Though, um, that did mean that the articles typically had to be substantive and, you know, about something that you were interested in, so that was actually pretty cool. But, uh, like Guybrush Threepwood, I digress. Anyway, because I had a subscription to Nintendo Power in 1990, that meant that I got sent a free copy of Dragon Warrior as part of a Nintendo promotion to introduce Western audiences to RPGs. As you can imagine, I lost my fucking mind when I found out. Free Nintendo game? Unheard of. Preposterous. This was seriously like, it was like the biggest news around my school for the entire fucking year. Some of you may not know this, but video games used to actually be kind of like a commodity, rare, prized, a treasured thing that, you know, it didn't really even matter if your game was in a genre you liked. A new game was a new game. I, I barely understood what a fucking genre was back then. That something was simply a Nintendo game mattered way more than what type of game it was. Fuck that, I just wanna play some new Nintendo, bitch. Um, it was a better time, a much better time, sorry to say. So yeah, I got my copy of Dragon Warrior and since I was just a little idiot kid, I tried to make a character <laughs> named Spike, but I hit the wrong buttons and I couldn't figure out how to backspace, so I ended up with a character named Spike Ooh. 
Uh, yes, I could have just started a new game. No, I didn't. No, I don't remember why. And yes, I only ever got like a few hours into it because I was stupid and young and didn't have even anywhere near the patience necessary to play an RPG like that. That was the last time I played a Dragon Quest game until Dragon Quest XI came out. And guess what? It's fucking awesome. I love it. I'm about 30 hours in playing in 2D mode on my Switch, and goddamn, I've needed a good JRPG to play since I beat the Switch release of Star Ocean like a few weeks ago or something. This fucker is brilliant, and if you're sick of waiting for Bravely Default 2 like I am, check this hell out. <laughs> I know that was a long, ridiculous, and wholly unnecessary story, but I think it's kind of endearing. Hopefully you do too. Anyways, lastly, we just want to mention just a quick few other games that came out in 2020 or around there. We haven't really gotten to playing yet around the crib, but based on input and discussion from many people whose opinions we trust, and eh, definitely think you should, Half-Life Alex, Ori and the Will of the Wisps, Sakuna of Rice and Ruin, Star Wars Squadrons, and of course, Ghost of Tsushima. Lastly tonight, I wanted to mention something that while well, I did kick off back in 2020, it's still a big dumb thing here in 2021, in which things are so bad that we can't even see anything anymore because we're trapped in a coffin and have been buried alive. I'm talking, of course, about the false dawn of the ninth console gen. That's right, I said it, in which we're faced with a new thing that we've never had to deal with before. Fake next gen. All right, I know that's, well, to people who frequent this channel, that's probably not surprising that I have this kind of perspective, but for anyone else, Let's backtrack a little bit. I'll tell you how I got there. So I was watching a review take USA video the other day where Big Daddy Richie was talking again about the Switch Pro and whether or not Nintendo was going to quote unquote milk the Switch. Though I've said it before, but overall, I probably agree with BD Richie more than I disagree with him. But it's this type of lazy, uncritical thinking that bothers me the most from him or any other content creator, really. And so after I paused the video and went and found my roommate so that I could yell at him about it under the pretense of smoking a blunt, <laughs> it really struck me just how incredible it is that still no one considers that just maybe, just maybe Nintendo knows what they're doing. I mean, after all, Nintendo is the only company that has refused to engage in the failed circular logic that dictates that the only measurable factors of a new console are how powerful the hardware is. But then again, Nintendo is also the company that released the Wii U, the Virtual Boy, and a game made out of cardboard, so perhaps the persistent underestimation of them is more understandable than I might have first thought. At any rate though, <laughs> most of what's discussed in that video makes sense, it's fine. But the very idea that Nintendo is going to milk the Switch dry, it just speaks of a fundamental lack of understanding of what the Switch even is and why it's so popular in the first place. And that got me thinking, right? So first of all, Nintendo is not in danger of milking the Switch dry, nor do I think that they will be whenever they eventually do release an updated hardware version of it. And why is that? Well, here's what's really going to bake your noodle later on. Because the console generation that the Switch is part of never really ended. It's still happening. Now, don't worry, I'll explain. First, think about this. Considering the Switch's form factor and why it's so widely adored, what could ever possibly put the Switch in danger of obsolescence? Not much, right? Nintendo had the brilliant idea of making a console based not on simply what was the most powerful hardware that they could afford to put in it, a strategy whose success would have relied solely upon their ability to make games showcasing that hardware, but instead on the idea that a console could be both portable and for the living room. Turns out that was a pretty good plan. So what then is this idea that there's some unknowable point at which the Switch will be milked dry? Last I checked, it outsold every other console in Japan last year and is doing nearly as well in the States. So what's the problem? Oh, oh, you're worried that the games eventually may not look pretty enough? <laughs> no, 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 stop laughing. That's, that's not an entirely retarded point, actually. At some point in the future, presumably, the graphics produced by the Switch will inevitably be outdated. The question is, when will that be? Seems that many people, like BD Richie, are assuming that time is either already upon us or fast approaching. Now, why would they think that? Well, simple, they think the ninth console generation has already started, and the Switch, being from the eighth gen, is therefore already technically outdated. These people are wrong. So yes, based on that and other factors, I say emphatically, no, the ninth gen has not started yet. Yes, yes, I did hear about how the PS5 and the new Xbox are out already. That doesn't matter. As long as all games are still releasing for eighth gen hardware, we're still in the eighth gen. 
You don't get to just arbitrarily upgrade some bits of hardware in your console without offering any noticeable or major improvement in your games and demand that I shell out 500 for the privilege of playing them. Especially when I can play those exact same games on the 8th gen console that I already have. Okay? So fuck you. There is no 9th gen yet. Alright? Why are people okay with this? How well do you think, for example, that the N64 would have sold if you could play Mario 64 on a Super Nintendo? Or if you could play GoldenEye Ocarina of Time on an NES? Or if all the N64 games were also available on a Super Nintendo? Yeah, were that the case, Nintendo may have had a much harder time selling us on the necessity of 64-bit gaming, don't you think? How eager would you have been to put up the dough for a 360 if all the games that came out on it were out on the original Xbox as well? Probably not too eager, I'm guessing. Why is it okay for Sony and Microsoft to do now what was obviously not acceptable back then? My guess is because companies can now use social media to gaslight and brainwash their customers, and if that's not enough, they can then count on the access media to finish up whatever they started. But that's neither here nor there. The point is, if you're making games that still come out on the last gen hardware, you can't tell me that the next gen has started. Okay, so why is it then that the PS4 Pro is not a next-gen console, but the PS5 is? It's got new hardware in it. What's the criteria here? Is it because it's the same UI? That seems kind of ridiculous, doesn't it? I say it's for no other reason than because Sony simply decided it wasn't. Xbox 360 games are still $25 to full price, for example. Why is that, do you think? Well, because they look entirely too similar to current-gen games. Eighth-gen games. You shouldn't be able to ask your customers to shell out for a 9th gen console if it doesn't do anything that the 8th gen console of yours that they already own doesn't do. I, is that such a crazy idea? I, I don't know. I don't think so. So, the date when the Switch will be milked dry or when it will start to be in danger of obsolescence, it's not actually a mystery. I can tell you the exact date when the clock will start for Nintendo on releasing a Switch with updated hardware. Not when they'll have to, just when the clock will start, because don't get it twisted, it has not even started yet. It will start on the day that a game is released for the PS5 that cannot run on the PS4. Not when a game is released that isn't put out on the PS4 because Sony is trying to leverage you into throwing down for PS5, Demon Souls, when a game legit is not released on the PS4 because it absolutely requires the hardware of the PS5. And you can tell. That's when the ninth generation will start. Until then, Nintendo has all the time in the world. <laughs> my, 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 what a fun episode today, huh? Thanks so much for chilling tonight, spending this little bit of your free time with us. We love you today. We love you all the way. And for more of our madcap hijinks and absurdity, make sure you keep it right here on Degree Listens, boys and girls. Coming up next week, we've got a lovely little piece on the predictable yet still enjoyable demise of another in a long line of failed Google endeavors, Stadia. Plus, we'll talk about whether I've got the diamond or the paper hands and just how much I'm down so far in this whole GME stock fiasco. That's next time on your favorite Help Me, I'm in Hell channel, Degreelessness. Degreelessness.